and welcome to Poznan and to our second Nordia Network Conference. Um, we're really delighted that so many people are here and I think in the next few days all the others are still going to join us. Let's see if we do better by Better? Yes. Um, in the end, the way we set up this Nordia Conference is that we combine over the teaching component with the research component to also show that, of course, much of the work that we're doing is not just about how we research youth foreign policy, but also how we talk to students and to the wider public. Um, I'm very happy that Adam agreed to host us here in Poznan, uh, and I will hand over to him uh, in a minute with some of the organizational things. Uh, but just one thing, please remember that the whole sessions are recorded. So we have a camera there, then we have a camera here. And the idea is that we put the videos afterwards on our website, so that also colleagues who couldn't be here can uh, look up uh, what we had been discussing, perhaps also get ideas. The only thing that we are not going to record is the run table today on the UN. But for the rest, well, we will have recordings from all the different things. Uh, for everyone who is not with us already for two years, please remember always to keep your receipts for reimbursement. I know it's a very practical thing, but it's really important that we also show that the way we spend our money is according, mm -hmm. according to the rules. And perhaps the last organizational thing from my side is, um, if you have get ideas during the workshop, or perhaps in two weeks' time, we always look for contributions for our website. So if you go to ufp.eu slash Nordia, uh, we really also try to keep um, a paper trail of the different discussions that we had. And if you have something from this workshop, or perhaps something that comes to your mind in half a year, please be in touch, because I think it's also nice to have different contributions. Without further ado, I hand over to our host, Adam, who will also speak some words of welcome. Okay, hello, welcome at uh, Adam Mitskiewicz University, Faculty of Political Science and Journalism. I would like to welcome you here on behalf of our dean, Andrzej Stema. Unfortunately, he couldn't be with us now, but probably he will join us for the dinner today, for some time. And tomorrow we also have the second dinner, also with probably Vice Dien. I'm very glad uh, that we could meet here in Poznan. Um, thank, you, thank you very much for Heidi, thank you much for Karolina and Helen for helping with organizing those parts. So once again, welcome. And now, uh, very practical issues. Uh, first of all, uh, as Heidi said, there are two cameras, so please uh, use the microphone during uh, yeah, speaking. So this is the first thing. Then the network EduRAM should work here, so you shouldn't have any problem with co uh, to connect uh, with the internet. I hope it will work, and it should work. Then uh, the plugins, sometimes they are under the table, so please check, and uh, if there is a need, here, for example, there is one place and in the, 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 the white boxes so uh, and also somewhere in the wall so this is what we have now maybe we'll have some uh, additional uh, ones but for, for now we have to share those uh, plugins and I hope there won't be any problem to, to, to you know to charge your uh, phone or, or laptop uh, what else uh, there is a water there are glasses uh, I, I hope that that will be enough then we have another uh, break coffee break then we have round table, before round table we have break, but not the coffee break, I would say. And then at the end of the day, uh, at uh, 6.30 we have a uh, few cabs, uh, which will take us to the city center, where we'll have our um, conference dinner, the first conference dinner. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. I will try to help as I can. Okay, so once again, welcome in Poznan. Thank you very much, Adam. And again, thanks to you and your team for hosting us. We all know it's always quite a burden to do this in addition to the end of the academic year, so we are really thankful for your support. For the rest, I think, again, if you have any questions, feel free to talk to Adam, to talk to me. Um, you also have in the program our mobile numbers, so in case you get lost and need help, feel free. Probably it's better to call yeah. Adam because he knows Poznan better than I do. <laughs> um, and for the rest, I would just say um, I'm looking forward to have another successful Nordic conference. For those of you who have been with us in Barcelona, I think it was quite a memorable few days. Um, so I hope we all enjoy and have successful nego uh, successful negotiations. <laughs> successful exchanges. Um, and without further ado, I hand over to Carolina, who was kind enough to organize our teaching workshop this year. Okay, 
thank you very much, Heidi. And yes, welcome to Poland. I'm really happy that uh, we are actually having a meeting in Poland finally within our networks. And uh, yes, I'm here to get us started. Um, we are following our established schedule still from Antero Network and now Nordia. So the first day of our annual conferences, we um, zoom into teaching. We deal with uh, different issues of teaching and learning in European foreign policy. And this year's theme is bridging the practice learning nexus in EU foreign affairs. And we are very lucky because today, as you will soon discover or you discovered, we have actually some academic practitioners here with us. So it is great we can engage uh, in debate with them as well. What we are going to do today, well first we have um, a teaching workshop on exactly that theme. So engaging practitioners in active teaching which uh, in a second I will give the floor to Niels because he will introduce um, this team and he will share with us his experiences and so uh, will Kolia Raube. Um, then we will have an assignment, so you know, uh, <laughs> no, not an assignment, some group work. And uh, just to share our experiences, then we will come back together and uh, we will then have maybe comments by our practitioners, academics, uh, guests, for sure from uh, Konrad Niklevich. Um, and discuss, you know, the lessons that we can all take uh, from here, and hopefully we can put something in writing as well uh, later for, um, you know, for others that cannot be here. In the afternoon, later on, we will have another workshop on fake news and the consequences for teaching on European foreign policy. And uh, this team results from a lot of frustration. I think not only my own, but also my colleagues. So how do we deal with the issue of fake news and its consequences in the classroom? And we are going to discuss, of course, whether this is something new or not, and uh, whether we need to adapt curriculum, or actually, um, well, it's just uh, something similar to what we had before. Um, so not such a big deal. I know that the opinions are divided. So this is what we will do later. And finally, as I think Heidi mentioned and Adam, we will have a round table on uh, Poland and the EU. So there is quite a tight uh, program uh, for this afternoon. Okay, what's before I give the floor to Niels, I don't think I need to uh, say much, just that this uh, issue of involving practitioners in teaching, it's not uncontroversial, you know, for me it seems something very natural mm -hmm. since I started teaching and uh, we had a very good workshop, a better workshop in Dublin, I see Ben was nodding, where we also talked about engaging practitioners and problem-based learning, um, so the, in this active learning it is kind of normal but then I joined also Leiden University and there I noticed that well you know when you join maybe more traditional department right that the opinion might be split and it's not something that you know is necessarily considered as a, well always a good thing uh, so then I also started thinking you know what are the challenges and maybe when should we uh, invite practitioners and how to do it but I don't want to say too much of what Nils has to say so I'm giving the floor to you still. Thank you, uh, Karina. Do you hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, yes, involving uh, practitioners. Uh, actually, the title of this workshop is Engaging Practitioners in Active Learning. Um, and um, uh, before, we, before we, uh, we start this session, I'm just curious to see um, who among uh, you did involve practitioners in, in their teaching. So, raise hands. Okay, some of you are not teaching, of course. Um, we also have some practitioners in the room. Um, were you involved in any academic teaching so far? Yes? Okay, very good. So we have a lot of experience. Um, and those who did not have that experience yet um, can make also a very valuable contribution, of course, because they might have a fresh look on these kind of things. And that is also really um, what I think is necessary. Um, I have some, some uh, experience with involving uh, practitioners and um, my feelings about that are mixed. Um, I think on the one hand it can be very valuable, but on the other hand you can also make um, a lot of mistakes uh, and ending up with uh, having involved practitioners that in the end didn't have any added value. And that's not necessarily uh, the fault of the practitioners, but also the design, the way you want to involve them. Um, so let me start with the negative side of things, uh, from my experience, um, and also uh, when I ask around among colleagues 
uh, they, they share this experience, that a very common way, of course, is to, if you have a big lecture series, for example, you talk about IR theories or foreign policy analysis or EU politics, whatever, uh, you invite somebody from the EU, in this case, uh, to talk a bit, a bit about a certain policy area. Um, one time, twice, two, three different speakers, doesn't matter, but quite isolated. So um, you talk about uh, foreign policy, EU foreign policy, you invite somebody from, from, from Brussels, and he or she is going to, to give, give a lecture. And you end up with somebody um, explaining to the students um, how it all works um, formally, so the institutions. So, um, well, we have a, um, a council, and uh, there's a European Commission, and then we have a foreign policy high representative, and uh, immerse them and then, and now it's such an, and so, and so forth. And then in the end, um, questions, um, and there are no questions, why? Because this is all stuff that the, um, that the students already learned from you, right? Um, and I think this problem is quite common. If I ask around, this is, this is often um, uh, the case. And this is, of course, I think, a very good example of how not to involve the practitioners, because this doesn't make sense that so you can better not do it. A more positive example, and uh, I will not be the only one giving also a positive example, because um, after me, Koya will also say a few things about, uh, well, I'm there, uh, about a positive example. But um, I've also been involved uh, for a few years in the training of Dutch civil servants. And uh, there was also a mix of academics um, teaching uh, these, um, um, they were all graduates, they studied political science or public administration or history or law, whatever. Uh, and in two years' time, they were um, um, taught more about all kinds of political processes, international, domestic, and support, so on. And it was a mix of academic teachers and practitioners. Um, so civil servants um, uh, that came, uh, or politicians, or whatever, that talked about their experience. But what happens in this case, and I think that's very good, is that um, it was repetitive. So for example, somebody could give a lecture in the morning and then uh, come back in the afternoon and um, give a review about policy papers that uh, students had uh, written, for example. Um, and, the, and the lectures were very um, much focused towards adding value. I'm not talking about the formal uh, procedures or the institutions, but for example, what happens behind doors, or they took a certain case uh, that, that in, in the end um, emerged, that in the end that through a big scandal, a scandal for example in the Netherlands, and they, they explained what happened behind the scenes. Um, let's say that the practical side of things, and that's exactly what you want of course as an academic if you invite a traditional. But in order to do that, uh, you need to meet certain conditions. And um, I have some ideas about that, but I'm also very curious to hear your ideas about that. Uh, and that's uh, why I uh, uh, drafted with uh, uh, Carolina and Koya uh, several questions that we're going to try to answer uh, in, uh, in several groups um, in a few few minutes. Um, and the idea is to come up with some lessons learned, some don'ts and do's when, when it comes to inviting practitioners. But before we're going um, to do that, I'd like to invite uh, Koya to share um, his experience with uh, involving the practitioners. Perfect. Thank you very much, Niels. Uh, thank you very much, Carolina. Thank you very much, Heidi. Uh, Adam, thank you very much uh, for, for having us. Um, I will try to find my um, presentation, which is here. I normally put it on here, so that's good news. And then we can start. Uh, what I want to share with you is basically one example. Uh, one example um, of uh, many, so to speak, um, how to uh, involve practitioners uh, in um, teaching EU foreign policy. Um, in a way, uh, what I did this year was, uh, as every year, teaching a course on the EU and global governance. And I think what is very important is that when you invite practitioners, uh, it is very important for the students to know what is the objective of the course and what is, so to speak, the contribution of the practitioner to actually um, have these objectives reached by the end of the course. So uh, it, it's, it's very straightforward, but it's very important that you keep a narrative towards uh, the students. Uh, what is the objective and what's the contribution? So in this course, we are talking about global governance, we are talking about areas of global governance, but we also talk about the EU's external action and representation um, in these various fora. And the big problem here is that different topics come together. We are talking about global governance, we're talking about the EU, and then basically the basic question is why should we actually bother 
about the EU in global governance. So this is, in a nutshell, the, the, the narrative. Um, and um, as a next objective, you, um, and, and that's what I try to do, I try to uh, tell the students that let's think about what that means, bringing together the EU and global governance and globalization. And so I start with this circle at, at, the, at the beginning of the year, um, asking the students to think about how can the EU actually get on the global stage as a first step. Um, what does it mean once it is on the global stage? Uh, what does it mean uh, when we talk about the EU as a global governor, such as other global governors, non-governmental organizations, but also other states, uh, in a specific global governance arena? And then, how can we possibly evaluate uh, the EU as a global government? And why do I say this? I say this because uh, from my point of view, and I think this is in general the experience, that uh, practitioners can make a contribution to understanding uh, the various stages um, of how you uh, look at the EU and global governance. But it needs uh, some careful drafting. So you cannot just put a practitioner in the classroom, you actually need to prepare students to uh, actually foresee the event and to engage with the practitioner. So there is, I think it, it's very um, important also for the students to have um, a good uh, experience with the practitioner that they are fully, so to speak, prepared. Um, uh, like uh, you all know it from the first interviews you did, for your own research, right? Uh, how terrible it is when you go into the interview as a PhD student and you wonder, you know, what if they are asking me a question, right? Will I be on the same level as the interviewee I'm sitting in front with? So it's the same situation for the students, actually, and we have to basically give them tools by, by, by giving them literature and prepare them um, through the literature to actually be on, let's say, uh, not an equal level with the practitioner, but to know what they are talking about. I think then you actually have a good, uh, meaningful um, experience. So then we have the invitation of the practitioner um, and the practitioner seminar. And what is very important, I think, is that you also have a debriefing. It doesn't need to be a whole debriefing seminar, but you should not just do as if things are just going on. My personal experience is it's very important that after that seminar you have a debriefing with your students about what are the lessons learned. What, where do we agree, where don't we agree, and uh, how can we take what we have learned into, let's say, the next um, round of the course, which would, for example, be a student paper, an exam, or your master thesis, whatever, right? So there, there needs to be a clear structure from, let's say, preparation to evaluation and then um, uh, facilitation for the students. So here, basically, I would like now to um, come in and, and, and kind of comment on what Niels just said. What you have here, for example, is now the learning objectives, and what happens is the practitioner comes in and tries to make sense of this, right? So in one way or another, the practitioner will, uh, will, will say certain issues from the practical experience on the ground and basically come up with a new narrative, right? With, with a narrative about what the EU is, uh, in terms of getting on the global stage, being on the stage, being a global actor, but also how the EU is evaluating itself, how it has been evaluated. Now, we could leave the students with, with this, right? But I think this is exactly where the criticism comes in. You should not have practitioners to actually, as a research object, uh, define what the EU is. You know, it should still be in the hands of the academic debate. And that's why we basically need another frame around the frame of the, of the practitioner. And in a way then, uh, you know, what you have is this kind of uh, scenario that the practitioner can give very meaningful input on all of these stages, but you need to provide 
the students with, 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 with the syllabus, with your own engagement discussions in class, um, to actually also contextualize this. And a very practical example, what we did this year in the course was we invited the um, uh, ambassador um, at large for the Arctic, Marianne Konings, um, to Leuven, and she gave a lecture after we, we had a preparatory seminar, we had the debate with her, and then afterwards we had the debriefing. And what is very interesting is, of course, that um, you come across a couple of um, unforeseen, uh, so to speak, um, um, issues. For example, you know, there is a lot of learning just by looking at her title, right? Uh, how can it be that there is something like an ambassador at large for the Arctic? You know, we all assume that there would be ambassadors attached to a delegation, or we assume that there would be EU special representatives um, for certain topical areas or geographical areas, but here you have the third animal, if you like, right? An ambassador at large. We ask her, so why, why, why is your title ambassador at large? Her simple answer was, because I think it is more meaningful and I can actually have more um, uh, representative added value uh, if I carry this title. So we didn't get much further than that, but there is, that, but there is uh, a lot to be, to be researched you know, from a pure um, uh, institutional point of view um, before you even get into the policy itself. And when you come to the policy, of course, um, you need to prepare um, the, the students and uh, what you have here is uh, a set of questions that we basically uh, try to answer um, in, the, uh, in the debate coming on the one hand from a global governance perspective uh, using the, the framework of Wies and Takur on, on global governance gaps uh, but also how the EU could make a meaningful contribution to this. And uh, what you basically also have as uh, a, a secondary issue is basically to which degree then an example like the one that the practitioner is representing here, the Arctic, can uh, basically be used as a magnifying glass to, to also uh, tell us what are the current ambitions and challenges of the EU in global governance overall, right? So you're taking one example, one issue area, and you try to basically then um, look into to which degree the findings here that you arrive with um, can be reproduced or, or, or um, uh, in, in other areas. So a couple of takeaways. Um, so I think it's very useful uh, to have practitioners in the classroom, but you need to embed them in the classroom. Um, and you need to uh, present this in, 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 in the context of a wider teaching objective. Um, uh, sorry, the title here. And you also need to basically um, utilize the practitioners, right? Like, like in, a, in a good interview uh, setting to answer some of your exploratory questions. Um, we are not, not necessarily trying to um, explain in the first place, but we, we also like to explore, especially in areas that are um, uh, relatively new uh, to, our, to our teaching and, and research. And also, uh, obviously, and that's what I meant with the second frame, uh, you need to embed these findings in the wider context of the academic research and literature so whenever you know, the practitioner says, uh, we are caring about norms and interests, uh, the EU's norms and interests in the Arctic, the question is basically what comes first, right? And obviously uh, the Arctic is a wonderful example because it's, 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 it's not clear at all what is coming first and to which degree certain interests prevail over norms. Um, it's also very important to utilize the so-called Brussels perspective, I think, but you should not become EU-centric, right? It's, it's very important that we keep a critical distance and that uh, this critical distance is also then delivered to the students 
final remark, pre -pre be prepared for additional work. I just looked this morning when I prepared this into my inbox. It took me 25 emails to get her to Leuven, right? Uh, following up on all the practical arrangements, setting up a dinner afterwards, bum, bum, bum. So you, you, um, you easily, you know, need to be prepared for, for um, yet let's say you have four um, practitioners in your classroom in one class for some 100 emails uh, that you have to write extra. Um, and and uh, this is only one part of the additional preparatory work. Thank you for listening. Okay, uh, thank you, Kolya. So now it's time for the uh, free homework. <laughs> one second. So uh, we have 25 minutes for some uh, group work, uh, and then we have a plenary session in which we collect all the uh, do's and don'ts that you have found uh, answering um, seven questions. Um, and these are the seven questions. Um, first question is about how to find and select a practitioner. Um, sometimes it's easy if you want to cover the Arctic and there is an ambassador at large uh, responsible for Arctic policy, it makes sense. Uh, but there might be cases in which there are more candidates uh, in a certain policy area and how do you select it? How do you not only select somebody who is knowledgeable, uh, but also who is a good speaker? Because uh, we all know as teachers that standing in front of a group is an art. Um, and not every bureaucrat is, um, <laughs> is fit to do that. What do you ask the petitioner to do? This very nicely links to what Kolya was already uh, presenting. Uh, what is the assignment that you give? Um, what is the homework that you give the practitioner beforehand to make sure that the contribution links in uh, with the general um, uh, teaching goals of the, uh, of the course? Preparation, of course you have to prepare the students, but how are you going to do that? Uh, what are the strategies and what are the, uh, what are the mistakes that you can make? Because I would like to, to, to ask you to think not only about the do's, but also about the don'ts. What are the traps? What should you, what should you not do um, uh, in order to avoid a uh, disappointing uh, involvement of a practitioner? Uh, duration. How long and how often do you involve the practitioner? Um, can it be repetitive? Um, um, is, is, is it sufficient, can it be sufficient to do it for one hour? And if so, how are you going to do that? Uh, timing, when in the course schedule, at the beginning, somewhere in the middle, at the end, um, in different, uh, in different uh, uh, ways. Crisis management, what do you do if the practitioner cannot deliver? Uh, because he or she is absent, because there's some other um, uh, more important uh, thing that, uh, that comes by. It happens a lot with um, uh, journalists and uh, politicians. Uh, so what do you do um, in order to um, compensate for the missed learning uh, experience of the students? But also, uh, what happens uh, if, uh, in spite of all your preparations um, and the lessons learned, there is a low quality contribution? Um, so how are you going to deal with that? And finally, um, examination. Uh, often a question that students pose uh, is, uh, oh, it's all nice to have these practitioners, but do I need to know this for my exam? <laughs> uh, 
So what's your answer uh, to that question? Huh? How are you going to, um, to deal with um, the contribution of a practitioner in relation to the uh, examination? So these seven questions, please look at the do's and the don'ts. And of course we have um, two practitioners in the room, uh, so they will also join uh, one of the groups. Uh, but I'm also very curious um, um, about their views on, on the subject and from their practitioner side of, um, of, um, or of viewpoint, uh, what they can say about these uh, questions. Um, I suggest that we make uh, four groups. Um, I take it that we are all, you know, grown up enough to, to make a, a, a selection on our own, or should we split it? I already see Heidi moving. <laughs> uh, for now, uh, I'm very curious to hear about the, um, uh, the best um, ideas that you uh, came up with. Um, can I start uh, on my left hand um, side? Group one, you're group one. <laughs> Are you there? Yes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, the other side. Sorry for this. Um, actually, we talked a lot about the selection of the practitioners, but we came to the conclusion it would be a good idea to invite them. Um, so that was good. Um, uh, and then we had a couple of um, yeah, experiences around the table, uh, ranging from personal contacts to the affinity of the practitioner to your university as an alumnus, or because the practitioner loves the university. Um, but also, the selection should also take place uh, based on certain criteria, such as gender diversity, um, uh, to allow uh, for a wide representation um, for example, functions or perspectives um, that are uh, otherwise not uh, in the classroom. So um, we clearly came to the point in the discussion where we said, well, some colleagues may look at this as, as if you do not do the job yourself. You're not teaching yourself. You are actually outsourcing. But uh, we came to the conclusion that exactly the, the diversity in the classroom is important that the students do not only have you teaching, but that actually various um, perspectives matter. Um, and uh, what is also interesting was that uh, from time to time, if you want to make it even more challenging, you may want to invite two people on one topic who potentially have two different perspectives. Uh, for example, two ambassadors uh, from a conflicting region. Um, and, and that uh, was uh, one example uh, that, that was shared as well. Um, the question is how you do this logistically. But, um, but, but that is um, uh, quite interesting. When it comes now to the other uh, issues, I'll be a bit quicker. So the role, um, what will the practitioner do? Um, basically, um, the practitioner could be invited for, for two different reasons and, and also assigned to do two different things, especially when you are not next to Brussels, uh, but if you have to fly in practitioners, you could assign the practitioners to give more of one content lecture or seminar in the morning and perhaps one more professional um, master level um, a seminar in the afternoon with a good lunch between. Um, so that would be uh, one suggestion. Uh, also, because you, you need to be a bit more, um, um, you know, you have to look into your budget and make uh, sense of the day for which you fly in the practitioner. Um, but you should also tell the practitioner what to expect. Um, so um, you, what to expect, who is the audience, uh, what will they know, what don't they know, uh, and, and, and clearly have um, the right expectations um, set uh, beforehand. Uh, how do you prepare your students? Well, you know, you have to perhaps tell the students a little bit about what uh, the institution um, is that the person represents, who the person is um, herself, himself, um, but also you, you should probably guide them towards a couple of questions which they may want to ask during 
the session. Um, and uh, you may want to um, back this up with, with additional readings, either more um, official documents, but also academic readings. And we also came to the conclusions that for the students, equally the debriefing is, is important. Um, quickly then, on duration, it can range. Um, it can range actually in some universities from just one lecture to sometimes contracts of 25%, uh, even to 100% contracts of practitioners. And uh, timing, uh, crisis management, and examination, um, uh, perhaps on the examination, um, everybody agreed that you have to make sure that students comply, so to speak, that they show up uh, in the lecture, and the best trick is to actually involve and, and, and make sure that the topic uh, of the lecture, of the seminar, is then also part of the examination. Excellent, thank you. So, all right, we continue with group two. Who can I give the floor? You. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, I'll start before getting over to Francisca. Um, so yeah, on selection, we thought one of the main things was to have a delicate balance between youth and experience. Uh, experience is quite clear. You don't want someone who's been on the job for just a couple of months, who answers I don't know to most of your questions. Um, with regards to age, on the other hand, we thought it would be quite helpful if uh, the practitioner still had their university experience in recent memory, simply because, at least at the EU level, most practitioners have some background in political science, law, or history, and so um, comparing their memory of what they learned in an academic setting versus their initial experiences in politics um, would uh, you know, be most fruitful with someone who is uh, younger. Um, then also choosing, um, yeah, the, uh, another selection criteria would also be how good they are in public speaking. Is something that you could perhaps find out via um, YouTube videos or their Twitter account. Um, it, even if you have a very experienced, very competent, very intelligent practitioner, if they cannot get the message across to students who, you know, aren't heavily involved with that specific subject area, then you're sort of dodging the pedagogical aim. Um, and the other thing is uh, akin to um, what was just said, if there are sort of national or institutional links between um, your academic team and the practitioners, um, that could be very helpful, particularly if these practitioners are from smaller countries, or these practitioners are alumni, uh, alumni of your um, institution. That is just um, a good way of um, making that contact. Um, the last point that I have written down as well is um, just to check what the work schedule is like um, of the practitioner, because if this is someone who has, I don't know, 50 public speaking engagements in a half a year, then it's likely that you won't get a more tailored, custom-made answer to whatever question it is you're asking, but you will get a standard presentation, um, hopefully with a little twist at the end to make it more applicable to your research aims. But um, really looking for someone who perhaps has less on her plate uh, would be helpful. And that's why I hand over to Francisco. Yes, maybe just to complement what Kolya already said, because I think there's going to be some uh, overlap. So we thought a bit about the different formats and how to um, incorporate the expertise of the person coming, but also um, really have an active engagement of the student side as well. So of course there are those lectures where you invite someone to talk about something behind the scenes, like anecdotal backgrounds and how the work you know, within EU institutions, for example, work. Um, making a comparison between theory and practice, maybe having someone with a background in political science and then comparing how these two um, come together. And then in some more practical ideas, we had, for example, the idea of having simulation games where then um, the petitioner comes along beforehand, ideally even before and after, or even during the simulation game, doing the briefing on how to conduct this in a professional setting, or giving feedback on how here the students performed on this practical um, job. Um, another idea was to organize roundtables to bring in the different perspectives, um, as Claudia mentioned, for example, from different DGs working on the same portfolio, 
to sort of um, show the different um, ideas. And then also the idea to prepare sort of MOOC style interviews just for a lecture that you give, for example, on the Council of the European Union and then have a short interview prepared with someone working in the Council Secretariat explaining in five minutes, this is my job, this is what I do. Ideally, live even, via Skype or something, but this could also be like a backup video that you have involving the protection of you. Um, and then we had the idea to sort of have this whole, um, those seven questions as an exercise for the students themselves. So if you have some semester class, that in the beginning you say, okay, this, these are the topics that we're going to have, and in the end you want to have a round table, and then you sort of set up the groups, and the students have to come up with exactly the answers to those questions and setting up um, a similar thing. And also on that, involving the students by, for example, setting in group, group assignments for dossiers for the upcoming lectures. So have the students prepare not just questions beforehand, not do just readings, but we get background materials and briefings to the upcoming lecture. Thank you, and well in time. We go to the third group, which was uh, this side of the table. Yes, um, so apologies if we repeat something that has already been said. In terms of uh, inviting and selecting the practitioner, uh, Conrad pointed out to choose a practitioner you know and avoid official channels. Um, and he mentioned that just two email exchange with Carolina. <laughs> um, <laughs> And obviously, uh, take into account the practitioner location, and then obviously at the disadvantage of less central universities that are in, in capital cities. Um, and uh, also, we uh, highlighted the uh, idea of inviting a practitioner that is fresh with the experience. So, uh, Conrad was uh, recalling his experience uh, coming out of the Polish presidency and how that uh, he thought that that was useful. And then depending on the scope and depth of the course, obviously if it's something very specific, you want to have somebody with specialized expertise, but also uh, one might consider inviting somebody that has a broader knowledge, otherwise students might end up asking questions and then the practitioner might answer, I don't know, or you know, give superficial answers. Uh, and in a sense, advisors to top figures might be a, a good idea because they have so such a broad network within uh, EU institutions. Um, Conrad especially is not a Skype fan because uh, uh, um, IT issues always uh, somehow come up. Um, and also we uh, thought about possibly thinking not just bureaucrats but also politicians, which obviously then involves the issue of you know bias and uh, the fact that they, they will present you know their own their own uh, view. Uh, um, but they might be used to more tricky questions and have a bit more leeway than a civil servant in, in addressing the questions. Um, in terms of points two and three, um, again, we said it's good to have a, a practitioner with an academic background. Um, and I think something that came up uh, in our uh, discussion was we want to create a comfortable environment for the practitioner to share not confidential information, obviously, but you know maybe a bit more the juicy details. And, and part of that uh, lies in asking students not to share uh, what goes on in the exchange on social media, or or unless obviously the practitioner agrees to it. Um, and then also we said that maybe it might be a good idea uh, going back to the format aspect. Um, some practitioners like Conrad prefer spending more time in Q&A rather than the practitioner lecturing for too long. And we also thought about simulations. Um, and um, and we think they obviously make sense if they're done well, because obviously you don't want to have an unrealistic simulation because that doesn't, doesn't really help. Um, moving on to the sort of crisis management, um, <coughs> Well, I mean, uh, we, we said about, we talked about uh, practitioners getting difficult questions and that it's kind of part of the part of the deal. I mean, they'll get difficult questions and they'll choose whether to answer or not to answer, uh, sort of evade the question. And if it's a low quality contribution, we we thought it's, it's the professor that needs to jump in and either ask questions or, and also um, sort of make up for it in the follow-up sessions with the students. So they need to get some juice out of their contribution somehow. Um, and obviously you need to be prepared and be flexible because the practitioner might cancel last minute, so you might want to reshuffle your syllabus around accordingly. Um, 
in terms of, of timing, obviously, I think everybody agrees that at the end is better because the students will have more substantive knowledge and ask better questions. Um, and I think something that was mentioned uh, that I, I think is a very good idea is to then follow up with the practitioner as well as the students. Um, so you might want to ask the practitioner what was their feeling, what whether they liked the questions, whether they have you know any any thoughts about um, the experience. And then finally, in terms of examination, yes, obviously threatening students with a grade is always uh, efficient. Um, and you obviously want to try and ask the students to embed the practitioner's intervention within the broader literature somehow and bring it back to the academic aspect of it. Um, yes, so that was us. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> All right, threatening students with a grade, right? Okay. Who would ever do such? <laughs> okay, last group. Uh, our report for this uh, this group. I've heard uh, a lot of things that we also discussed, um, but let me try to single out some elements that I uh, have not heard yet, or at least as far as I know. Um, about selection, uh, I think one of the things that also should be done is to make it interesting for the practitioner. Um, so, what is the added value for the practitioner to come to your institution and? Um, give this lecture or participate in this workshop, and I think there are many um, uh, interesting uh, ways uh, to do that. Um, but there must be something for this person uh, that, that interests uh, him or her. Um, well, about the don'ts of, of selection, I've heard several, um, but I think one of the most important is quality control, right? Just not um, um, not being being satisfied with with the person that is. Um, uh, that happens to be uh, available, but really uh, try to make sure that you have someone who can uh, can can uh, deliver and, um, and make it interesting for uh, the students. One of the other elements was also um, because that might be the case a bit with um, us teaching about EU. Um, don't forget um, other creatures uh, aside from uh, politicians or bureaucrats. Um, think about journalists, uh, NGOs, uh, and so forth and so on. And I think there's a trade-off because I, I see the arguments why um, it could be very nice to have relatively young civil servants or practitioners, but then the ex-politicians uh, or the ex-civil servants are also a very um, good idea to, to have them in because uh, they can speak more freely, uh, they often are more available, um, so I think you should just try to go for a, a good mix of that. Then, uh, what do you ask the practitioner to do? Uh, well, you have at least to prepare this uh, practitioner and and and, um, and tell them um, your 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 expectations, um, and also tell them about the audience. Uh, indeed, um, it, it would be nice, of course, if the practitioner tells. Um, actually, that is what you should ask this person to do: to tell about the real world uh, in, in 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 politics. Um, and you can ask the audience not to uh, to record and distribute uh, that what is being said, but I think you should never um, rely on that because we all know there is just uh, you only need one student who does record it and, and spread it around. So I think there's a there's a, there's a, there's a risk there. Um, also think about uh, ask a practitioner to do other things than just delivering a lecture, but also I heard before. Um, involving them in simulations, for example, as, as, as reviewers, um, and so forth and so on. Just, not, just do not just ask them to tell a story, for example. Uh, about preparation uh, of your students, uh, give them, of course, homework, but do not assume that readings will be enough. Uh, so, for example, uh, start with a lecture before the practitioner comes, or a session in which you discuss the, 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 the literature that they need to read uh, for the uh, session with the practitioner, so they're really well prepared. You can assign um, certain uh, tasks to students, uh, chairing the meeting, discussing the meeting, uh, thinking about questions and so forth and so on. Uh, assure attendance uh, because you don't want to uh, end up with an empty, um, empty classroom. And of course it's also connected to the exam question, but uh, <laughs> you might also uh, give them some positive uh, <laughs> reasons to be there and not only threaten them. Um, Duration. How long or how often do you involve the practitioner? Uh, well, many different ways. You can invite him for one single time, but then you should embed it really well into the, um, 
degree program, but you can also think of an entire module of visiting uh, practitioners. Uh, but the key here is to embed it into the wider program and also uh, link it to the, uh, to the learning uh, outcomes. What you should not do is just uh, randomly plugging practitioners in. Um, and one of the other don'ts we, we found is also do not forget uh, to talk with the practitioner about time management. Um, it has occurred, uh, in my case, that practitioners came in uh, for a talk uh, twice, 45 minutes, and they had like uh, 98 uh, PowerPoint slides. Well, of course, that's not going to happen. Uh, fifth uh, question, the timing. Again, it doesn't really matter, uh, as long as you think about it and uh, embed it into the, the wider program. You can uh, ask practitioners um, uh, in the beginning of a course, but they must have some basic knowledge. So the context is important in which you do that. Um, and just do not put the practitioners at the end just to have, you know, uh, to outsource your teaching or uh, just to have them and that you can tick the box and say, okay, I have a practitioner in my course. That is, of course, is something that you should not do. Crisis management, have a backup plan, uh, so if, um, if the partition doesn't uh, show up for what, whatever reason, uh, you can perhaps um, indeed show a documentary movie, or uh, you can um, um, let discuss some additional written material of the uh, practitioner if it is available, and so forth and so on. When there is a low quality contribution, uh, we said, well, it would also be good to already intervene if it's really bad. Intervene, it takes a lot of courage but, uh, and, and the, the diplomatic skills, but intervene during the, um, uh, during the, during the contribution. Um, so that's for the brave among you. Um, the don'ts in this respect is uh, don't suffer in silence. Uh, discuss this with, your, <laughs> discuss this with your, your students and um, also review it with your students and say, listen, uh, this went wrong. Uh, how can we avoid this in the future? What do you think about that? Uh, and discuss with them why this is a bad presentation, because they can learn it for their own, uh, own presentation. And then finally, the examination. Don't say it's not relevant for the exam, because uh, you will be in trouble. On the other hand, I would start a discussion, that's what I always do with my students, uh, not only about this uh, particular topic, but if they ask, is this for the exam, I um, ask them a question and say, why do you ask this? Uh, because ideally, um, don't start to laugh because it happened in the group, but ideally we teach students not, uh, of, students study not for the exam, but to have, uh, to, to learn about politics in our uh, case. Um, so you can have a nice discussion and use that, that um, a question to, uh, to broaden their horizon and um, uh, let them know that uh, there's more in life than, than all the exams. <laughs> Alright. Um, Thanks a lot for your uh, contribution. I think we heard um, a lot of good do's and uh, also good tones. Um, so we're going to wrap this up in a document and of course uh, share it with you. Uh, but before we do that, of course, the practitioners were involved in the small groups, but I would like to give the opportunity uh, for a few more minutes uh, for um, Conrad, uh, and if you want, Robert, to uh, maybe if you have something to say from your side as a practitioner about this topic, um, this, is, um, this is your chance. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Um, I've shared most of my insights with my group, and they were very well presented, thank you. Um, uh, I would just try to uh, raise your attention to two points. I mean, first of all, think about the right person while choosing your practitioner. Um, I, it was, uh, I've done it on purpose. Uh, if I was, for example, doing a course related to the, the works of the uh, European Council, uh, of course, idea, ideally, it would, it would be to have done task, tasks, but it's not always possible uh, to have it on, on, as a practitioner. But if not done a task, then uh, I would uh, uh, advise you to uh, get his chief of cabinet. He's a shadowy person, Piotr Serafi. But believe me, I mean, everything Donald to success in the council, before the council, at the press conference, as a Piotr knows it by heart, a few days before. <laughs> so, um, and that brings me to the second point. It's good to have put stuff in phone number in your, uh, in your uh, address book. Uh, so please get out of your ivory towers and try to get in touch with politicians and, and bureaucrats, high ranking bureaucrats. It is possible. And if it's not possible for you to get in touch with Pertzerov directly, then use your friends because there's a theory that you can connect with everybody in the world through five persons. So. Um, uh, use your connections because uh, this way it, it, it makes it easier for you 
to get the practitioner into a comfortable situation. Because when Karina asked me to do a lecture, I did it at the fifth pleasure. I know Karina, I know Adam, and I don't have to ask much, many, many questions, sorry. Um, and I just come, I show up. <laughs> uh, so if you know the practitioner, it's logistics getting much easier. And the second point, uh, clarifying the rules of engagement. If you ask a politician and the politician show up, usually you don't have any problems with off or on the record questions. But if you invite a, a bureaucrat or an expert, advisor, whatever, clarify, I mean, what are the rules of engagement? Is the, uh, the room confined? Is it the, uh, what are the rules, uh, what, what students are going to do with the knowledge they, they acquire? Are they going to quote the bureaucrat in the papers, etc., etc.? Make sure that the practitioner is uh, comfortable with the situation. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Robert, do you have anything you want to say at this point? Uh, nothing useful, but I'll say something. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say something that's not really useful because this kept. I kept remembering an incident when I was working, and I was working actually quite hard. Uh, and, and officials do actually in Brussels. I mean, I used to work 12 hours a day, uh, less on Sundays. Um, but the. Um, what I remember, and, and being very busy, what I remember was I had a date in my diary that I had to go and speak to uh, to someone or other on, I can't remember what the subject was, on European security or something like that. And I remember vividly trying to work out, while I was giving this lecture, exactly who it was I was delivering the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> So all I'm saying is actually officials are sometimes very busy. By the way, the answer to the question, who was it, which I just about figured out by the time I left the room, was it was the um, parliamentary committee, the parliamentary assembly of the WEU, I would speak. <laughs> A totally useless body, um, which uh, eventually got abolished. I, mean, I, I should say eventually, because um, first of all, abolishing things is very difficult. Um, when we abolished the WEU, um, that wasn't the same thing. The parliamentary of the assembly of the WEU continued to meet long after the WEU had been abolished. Um, that was the, those were why I couldn't understand who and these people were. So that's not a very useful thing in real life. Very useful, after all, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you all. Uh, we are closing now this first uh, session. Um, I propose that we have now a break until a quarter to uh, four, um, and then we will start with the second teaching panel. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, welcome to the second teaching workshop, which will be a little bit broader in its scope. And it's entitled Fake News and the Consequences for Teaching on European uh, Foreign Policy. And I have to admit that, as I told you before, the origins uh, come from frustrations faced by some academics, some of them at this table, um, that are linked to these problems, right? Misinformation, fake news, and sources. And I guess when I think about myself, so um, a personal story, I think it started really hitting me with the um, around the time of uh, Wikileaks. And I was then in Maastricht, and students started coming in and saying, well, you know, can we actually use Wikileaks? Because there's a lot of great information there. We cannot get anywhere else, and you know, and so on and so on. OK, tell us later uh, about that. And we kind of, I remember it was back then, where also a bit less was known about uh, you know, the origins. We less than we know now. And I remember that the policies of academics were very divergent. So some of my colleagues would say, yes, fine, by triangulate, but to be honest, uh, can you triangulate the uh, leaked uh, cable? It's very difficult. You can, uh, and master students and bachelor students, they are post, well, you can't expect them to go to practitioners and, you know, ask about that, or, so it's a different thing. And some, you know, wanted to do this for some analysis or, you know, uh, uh, some other work on that. Um, so I was considering, you know, how you deal with that, and I talked to them more about sources, but I do know that some of my colleagues said you cannot, you definitely cannot use that, and then some say you can use that. And, you know, and sometimes it would be interesting if those two approaches would kind of clash being uh, examiners of the same thesis. 
for example, right? So there was a problem, I thought, with that. We didn't really know exactly, and I know ju academic journals were also split, right? Some of them would not take submissions if there was weakness, whereas some others would. Um, so that was the first thing, and then it started appearing, at least from my perspective, more and more often. So I started especially teaching on European foreign policy and the East. You know, you, you, you kind of got students coming up with Russia Today and Sputnik, uh, then on the other side, Breibart, and kind of, you know, is, there any, is this anything new or not? But I did notice, I guess, more confusion than we had before, and I kind of um, treated it on a case-to-case -case basis and sometimes addressed the whole room about, uh, you know, what is a reliable source. But then even more new sources started coming in and more confusion about well, what do you mean credible source? Is a media outlet? So, you know, that's uh, my frustration uh, grew and grew. And then the issue with fake news, you know, completely fabricated uh, news and how the students, uh, you know, and how this affects our teaching. So then we decided to have this uh, discussion here. There won't be homework, uh, but uh, we decided to share with you our experiences and maybe to talk together about, you know, is this new or not? And uh, is there anything we should be doing or, you know, we shouldn't exaggerate and... Uh, we should just kind of improve the curriculum uh, that we have. So this is the origin of this uh, banner. So uh, on the banner today we have Konrad Niklevich, so we're very lucky to have an academic, because Konrad has a PhD also, but practitioner. Um, and I, I think, Konrad, first time we kind of got in touch, you were, um, I don't know if it was afterwards, but when I heard about you was when you were the spokesperson of the Polish presidency, right? So uh, in the center of things, and then dealing with communication as well. At the moment, Conrad is the kind of advisor to the mayor of Warsaw, but he is in charge of research, right? So uh, in the in the city hall, the city I can hall. say in the city hall, right? But he has many different kind, of, I would say, hats, uh, many different practitioners' hats, and a lot of experience. The one we are interested in today the most, I would say, um, is the that Conrad is a member of the European the was exactly you just told me that it's just finished, so it's nice you can tell us what happened of a European Commission high level group on fake news and disinformation. Right? I didn't know there was such a group, so it's great. And I asked Conrad specifically. I said, don't worry that it's a bit descriptive, but please take like ten minutes and tell us something about it. Right? So what's going on? What's this group about? Um, I'm curious whether they are, they are kind of links to national groups, maybe there are not some groups. So this is not yet that much about teaching, but we wanted to take advantage of Conrad being here and telling us a bit about that and about the role of academics then in the whole process, because you know it's, that might be interesting for us as well. And then we have Joost, uh, we have Coria and Heidi to uh, link this, what Conrad will be talking about, with their own experience uh, you know, with this uh, problem and with this issue, and then we can hopefully have some uh, common discussion about that. Okay, so that's the plan. And uh, without you know taking more of your time, I pass the floor to Kona. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Karina. It's my pleasure to share my insights on high level group and on the papers with you. Um, with high level group, uh, and the full name is high level expert group. Uh, it's the advisory body of the European Commission and it is usually set up by uh, one of the Commission's directorates general. And the, the, the task of the high uh, level experts group are usually to give the expert insight on complex multi layer issues that are very relevant to the current social and economic development. So when, this, when the European Commission announced its plan to set up a high level expert group on fake news and disinformation. It was November 2017. Uh, the, the problem of fake news, the problem of disinformation within the, 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 the media ecosystem in the European Union was very high on the agenda and it still is to a certain, certain um, account. Uh, anybody can apply to be a member of the high level expert group because the, um, the European Commission uh, opens the calls for applications publicly. The members are chosen based on their affiliation, on their professional experience, but also some other criteria are taken into account, such as for example the, the geography, because the European Commission 
tries to have experts from different parts of the opinion, and that's, for example, of course, very understandable. Um, the high-level group on fake news had a mandate of one year. It was uh, for a year 2018, but I must tell you that our job was done within the framework of three months only, because the European Commission, the Director General mm -hmm. uh, for Communication, asked us to, to be brief and quick because the issue was very um, pertinent. So we were able to present the high-level expert group uh, report, that is our view, our conclusions on the subject, already in March 2018. For the rest of the year, we were consulted, we were invited to some events, etc. But basically, our job was done in the first three months of the year. And as I, as I explained, the mandate expired uh, in, by the end of 2018. Uh, every year, the European Commission creates like two, three of high level expert groups. So please uh, uh, check out the European Commission website and look for the for the calls because one day you might be willing to join one of the high level expert groups and and give your insights on, on, on complex matters. complex matters. Um, of course you can ask and you should ask me I mean what is the actual um, input of the high level group and I will be very very frank with you uh, the it's not the biggest impact here you would expect. Like most advisory bodies, the added value is in um, advice given to the European Commission officials and the high level expert group can call itself successful if the, the decision takers at least partially take the advice of the expert group, which is not always the case. Um, the, the, this particular high-level expert group was tasked with um, five, uh, five things. First of all, the analysis of the current situation and the legal framework, and the potential political and social risks associated with uh, the problem of disinformation. Um, secondly, it was tasked to uh, define the responsibilities of all relevant stakeholders. Thirdly, uh, the high-level expert group on disinformation and fake news was asked to uh, assess how effective are the voluntary measures taken by different stakeholders and especially the social media platforms. Fourth, the, the high-level group was asked to uh, identify the guiding principles on how the self-regulation, and I stress self-regulation, can solve the, uh, the problem of fake news. And finally, um, the high-level expert group on fake news was um, asked to make sure that the advice given to decision takers is uh, data-based, evidence-based. The academic representation in the high-level expert group was very important. There were um, at least, uh, officially, there were seven uh, representatives of uh, different European universities, among them Oxford, Sorbonne, Aarhus, uh, Bocconi. Um, in a few elements of the final report, you can clearly see the input of those people, of academics. I and mean, first and foremost, it, it was uh, because of them, because of the insistence of the academics that the, the group decided not to use the term fake news at all, as you will probably see in the report. I mean, I guess some of you might have read the report. The term fake news is used only once at the beginning, explaining why the report is not going to use this term anymore. <laughs> because fake news is as much as fake news in general, the deliberate uh, attempt to disinform, it is also a political tool. Donald Trump, President of the United States Donald Trump, calls fake news any piece of information he disagrees with. And for the general public, it's kind of a confusing. So what exactly is fake news? Is it something politicians disagree with or is it 
something other. So the high-level expert group on this information, I'm starting not using the term fake news, decided to use the term disinformation as a proper definition of the problem and decided not to use the term fake news at the insistence of academics. Um, there were other parts of the report which were highly influenced, influenced sorry, by the academics, but there's one complaint I, I really have to share with you. At the very end of the proceedings, uh, there was a... I struggled to use a different word than battle, but that was a word battle between the representatives of civil society, like for example consumer groups, consumer protection groups, and the representatives of the social media platforms, the big fishes like Twitter, Facebook, uh, Google, um, and YouTube, which is part of Google, de facto. Um, and there was a struggle how to word the, the report. Uh, to make the long story short, the uh, representatives of the, of the industry, they they've done utmost to strike any suggestion that the problem of the disinformation can be solved through the legislation, especially European level legislation. Um, we all know now that some countries decided to disregard this uh, uh, opposition and some countries like Germany legislated in the area, but the industry tried to make sure that the report does not suggest that the legislation is the proper way to, to solve this matter on the, on the European level. The, the civil uh, society representatives, the, especially the consumer protection groups, uh, they called for a language which, which would suggest that legislation should be considered as a last resort solution and it should be included in the report. And Again, this is my personal perspective. Please do disagree with me, and please do have your own opinion on that. But I was uh, I was saddened that in this discussion, the academics took a neutral stance. And they decided not to take a position, and they left the matter to be decided between the fighting camps. And, and at the end, if you look at the report, you clearly see that the industry has won. The mention of legislation is very, very vaguely um, uh, hinted, if I may say so. It's not clearly stated. Uh, but then again, I should, I mean, this is my personal opinion, my complaint, if I may call it so. But uh, I do appreciate the, the input of the academia into the report, and it will be much poorer without this input. So um, my, my head off to. Academics. Uh, shall I uh, give you the, 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 the outlook of the recommendations of the report of the high level group? Or? Okay. So, I mean, the, the, the report says that uh, I will only uh, refer to the points that uh, are directly linked to the academia. First of all, academia has to play a bigger role in uh, increasing media literacy. Because increasing media literacy, according to the report, is one of the best and most easy and easiest solutions uh, to, 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 to solve the problem of disinformation. Secondly, academia, according to the report, should cooperate more with news media and implement skill and age-specific uh, media and information literacy approaches. Also, members of the academia should be, as simple as that, more present in the media news. And that um, leads me to another point. The report somehow shows that the academia should leave the ivory tower of academic research and try to reconnect with the general public. In the age when the emotions trump knowledge, we badly need academia speaking up and defending the knowledge, which is sometimes uh, in opposition to emotion. And we better hope that our policies are based on knowledge and not emotions. Um, academia uh, insisted, and it was absolutely right so to do, on putting the focus on transparency. We really need to 
make the social media platforms, the, the big guys in the room, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, to, to, uh, to give us more information on how the engines, how the platforms work, how they operate, so that the, at least academics can research the, the algorithms, can research the mechanisms underlying the, the, the social platforms. Because right now, I mean, now it's much better than it used to be, but two years ago, in beginning 2018, end of 2017, um, the algorithms of Facebook were like a black box. I mean, we could guess how they work, how they run information, how they run elements shown on our screens. I mean, what makes this particular element be shown to me and not to my colleague sitting next to me in the same room, etc., etc. This transparency has to be increased, and that's and that's one of the main conclusions of, of the report done at the request of the academy. Um, now, other elements I should mention: the European Commission uh, uh, should help and coordinate creation of centres of research excellence related to the fake news, and uh, there should be new financing tools to finance the, um, the, the research related to, to fake news. And that's basically, that's basically the, um, the, the, con the conclusions of the report that are directly related to, to the academia. Um, my final conclusion is that um, I do personally believe, again, this is my personal view, and please, uh, it's Please don't think, for example, that Mary Traskowski thinks. So this is my personal view. I do believe that the legislation is the way to fight the, the problem of the fake news. I do believe that we should end the legal exemption that is granted to social platforms. As you probably know, social platforms are totally exempt from responsibility for what's published on their um, on the, on, on the, on the platforms. On, um, with some exceptions, some countries like Germany, and now the, in France the legislation is underway, uh, some countries change the, <coughs> the, the, the playing field, and now, in Germany for example, the, the platforms partially take responsibility for what is published. If, for example, if, if they are unable to take down a piece which is against the German law, on, for example, hate speech, or any other uh, um, form of speech which is uh, not allowed, then it could be heavily fined. But, this is German, in the United States platforms are totally covered still. In most of European countries platforms are covered by the exemption and they, 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 they don't have any responsibility. This is something I believe is wrong. I believe we should treat platforms as media companies not entertainment companies, not neutral carriers, and I do believe that we should apply, it's impossible to apply exactly the same rules as we apply to newspapers or, or to television, but we should try to find a solution which is similar. We should introduce kind of a media laws that cover social platforms as well, in order to address the problem of fake news. Well, um, on, on this point, uh, I will end my introduction, and I would love to answer all the questions we have. Okay, great. Thank you, Conrad. And uh, we will guys have a chance to engage and comment on some of these. And it, you know, especially the last part of what you were saying, and uh, also about algorithm, uh, made me think about a story that Richard Whitman told us. And he's not here, so he cannot share it. A while ago, he asked his uh, rather he teaches at Kent, right? Rather a large class. Um, who of you, of students here, who of you have read a newspaper recently? Almost no hands up. And I said, well, who of you kind of watches the main news? Almost no hands. And then he started thinking, okay, where do you guys take your news from, right? And a lot of them would say, well, from Facebook or Twitter, right? Without an understanding where, why are you, re and, and then he kind of challenged them and started saying, well, you know you are reading a selective kind of number of news that's being selected to you rather than, you know, going to a different source of selecting yourself. So what you told us and uh, how algorithm works and whether it should be legislated is very relevant for us uh, as well. But so may I add an, an, an echo? 
while researching for one of my papers, I've talked to an uh, online editor-in-chief of uh, Belgian Lisboa. And he told me that, I mean, he, he is the chief of online Lisboa edition. He works with Facebook on daily basis, uh, hourly basis even. And he told me that on his private Facebook account, never once he saw a piece of information from Lisboa. Not once. Editor-in-chief of online version of Lisboa. Okay. Ah, great. Now, the, um, I will give the floor to Jost, to Jost and uh, I see the spelling mistake, it's totally of my own doing. <laughs> I have to shamefully admit, but the, <laughs> yes, uh, Jost okay. Hendrik Morgenstern Pomorski, uh, some reflections from Jost. Okay, thank you very much and um, thanks Karin and Heidi for, in, for inviting me. Um, we are moving a bit from the, from the high level group to the low level uh, kind of expert maybe. Uh, because I'm, uh, what I'm trying to present are some thoughts that are based purely on experience teaching. But, uh, I, I don't have any particular knowledge of fake news or, or related concepts, um, other than that they keep on cropping up. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. I've tried to organize my thoughts uh, for, for this uh, yeah, round table, or this, this workshop, and I hope we can, we can enter into a discussion, right? I will not present any solutions, I'm afraid. Um, because I think also it's a, it's a more general topic, of course. It's not EU foreign policy specific. Uh, I, I have it in all courses that I've taught. Um, and what I noticed actually when preparing for this event is that uh, it, it's really fitting we do this here in Poznan, where the faculty is one of political science and journalism, something that actually has been lost in a lot of other uh, university settings. And I think that's something that maybe we should uh, um, have a look at again, right? That uh, there is something that does connect us to journalism. Um, even though we, as in thinking in our discipline, always look for the things that divide us from the things other people do, right? Historians, journalists, uh, and so on. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, so again, this is a very personal um, kind of teaching perspective of it. Um, and I'm very glad that Conrad already talked a little bit about this um, discussion of concepts, because of course what I want to talk about isn't really fake news, because that's actually a very small phenomenon, uh, completely fabricated, uh, news with the intention to kind of deceive, that is already a very specific subset. Um, I'm also talking about hyper-partisan news, so where the interpretation weighs a lot more than the factual delivery and so on, uh, because that is a problem for students, right? That, those are the kind of sources that, if they are used by students, will uh, cause trouble for them, right, in their assessment, uh, because that's uh, something we academics don't want to see, and that's what we're trying to teach them, how to uh, use proper sources in a proper way. Um, but I think that these uh, things are changing. I've, I've taught on two different kinds of programs, um, and the problem is the same. So I think there is a general phenomenon at play that we need to start engaging with a bit, a bit more. Um, and it started uh, at the beginning of my teaching, actually. It was very rare. You had a couple of links to videos from RT, for example. Um, and at first, you don't really register that, right? Because, well, OK, it's a video. You get an ex excerpt of a speech. Um, what does it matter that it comes from RT, so Russia today, for those who are not right, uh, dealing in, in EU foreign policy, but I think most of you are. Um, but it, it, you know, it could matter, and, and that's something we need to convey to students, and I think we have very uh, basic tools only um, available uh, how to do that. Um, I think when you're looking at, especially political science research on fake news, disinformation, um, hyper-partisan news, we, we can actually, on the one hand, see some positive things. So that actually, it's not our students' generation that is the biggest problem, right? The sharing of uh, disinformation and so on is, is largely done by, by actually older people who are not used to the use of, of social media. But there are other problems that are still coming, because I don't think that we are teaching at the moment the, the fully digital generation yet. Um, and if you look at some research that Pew has done on the use of news, um, and I think that's something that comes up in my experience as well, is that young adults, and you've just said that, right, follow the news less closely, right, in the way that we understand it, with the sources that we take as news sources. Um, and they tend to have more negative views of news sources as well, kind of assuming mainstream news media to have uh, bias, uh, to be, in a sense, dysfunctional as a, as a, as a news media item in one way or the other. Um, and and that, that's a problem in a way that is still coming. I don't think we actually have seen the problem yet uh, fully. And that's part of the problem why we, we haven't responded to it. Um, so if you look at um, political science research that is done, actually they are focusing on fake news, so just fabricated information. 
Um, but, but that really isn't, isn't the problem you have with students. Uh, uh, even though it's, it's, it's happened too, I've had it in papers too, completely fabricated stories. But it's much more common to have sources that are questionable. Um, and of course, we, we, all, we have different understandings of what that means. Um, so, uh, just to, as an example, in my American Studies courses, um, I consider Fox News to be an unreliable news source. I do not allow my students to, uh, to, to cite it without context um, as, a, as a source for what happened. Um, I'm not sure colleagues in America could do the same thing, right? Because you're entering a very political um, question, right? Uh, I'm, I'm clearly excluding a new source that is, is partisan. Um, so am I entering a partisan uh, discourse as an academic? Should I do that, right? Um, again, we haven't had a conversation about that. I've only had individual conversations uh, with colleagues about that. And I think it's time we, we have a bigger one. Um, so that's, uh, that's something that, that happens more and more, and um, it happens in first-year undergraduate courses, in second-year undergraduate courses, in third-year undergraduate courses, when students are writing their thesis. Um, so it's not a problem that is, in a sense, oh, this will work itself out. Students are just beginning. They don't know how to use sources. No, actually, um, they don't fully internalize what we mean by um, evaluating and critically assessing sources. Uh, throughout their undergraduate degree, and I think that's, uh, that's highly problematic. Um, so, um, I have three more points. I hope that I, ha I have the time to, to kind of raise them that I wanted to distill from, from, from these thoughts. Um, first, I think that dealing with fake news, with disinformation, with hyper-partisan sources, isn't a one-time event. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's not going to be a course with, uh, that we do and uh, we're going to solve the problem, for the at least for the students in our degree program. I don't think that's the case. It's a learning process. It will require repeated interaction, um, and it will require also active learning, right? That we use these uh, tools that, that we use so so nicely in, in, in substantive areas, um, also for these basic skills uh, sets that students learn how to manage their use of sources um, in, in this new environment. Um, second, I thought. Um, and I, again, I've hinted at that already, that as a teacher, I, I don't think I have the tools as my, at my disposal yet to actually uh, be as effective as I think we, we could be. Um, and that's because I only um, make ad hoc um, solutions to the problem, right? I uh, throw overboard a course schedule and discuss sources in the first year, in the second year, in the third year courses that I teach. Um, again, but these are patches, right, too, because I have to abandon something else that I had planned. Um, in order to, to engage with that. Um, and while, again, these patches work for what we want to achieve, they are not systematic solutions to the problem. This is that something that Conrad was asking us uh, to do, to engage more, more systematically. Um, and I think, thirdly, there's, there's something, and I noticed that particularly in a humanities-based um, course program that I, that I worked in, uh, that there may be a problem in the way we transmit uh, and engage our students in being critical uh, that actually might be helping uh, the disinformation rather than, uh, than the opposite. Um, I've had it on multiple occasions that students who wanted to be particularly critical um, used Sputnik, uh, RT, I mean just to name a few, right? I don't want to be too partisan, but these are the ones that are the most common maybe. Um, because they thought, well, the mainstream, again, the mainstream is biased, so I'm going to be critical. I'm going to go outside the mainstream, and then I'm being critical, right? So, so maybe actually even in our standard uh, courses on skills and, and so on, we're not doing too good a job at, at um, transmitting what we think we mean by being critical, right? That it's not deviating from the mainstream, that actually the mainstream has something very valuable to offer, um, and, and, and being critical is, is based on logic, on argument, on, on evidence that is presented, and so on. Again, I think we, we, we still need to work on that. Um, so where does that leave us? Um, and of course, you've already, Conrad, you've asked a couple of things. And, and as, as always, um, when I look at that list, uh, I, I actually agree with most of it, right? Uh, yes, we, we should uh, work to improve media literacy. But for that, we need changes in the curriculum, for example. Um, I don't teach just what I want, right? I teach in a, in a, in a program um, where certain things need to be conveyed. There needs to be a curricular response. And I think the people who manage curricula tend to be too distant from the students um, that they've actually even picked up on this problem yet. Um, and that's why I think it's good we're having this conversation, because I think, again, it needs to be a, a louder conversation, uh, because we need a curricular response. It's not done with individual patches. Um, 
And again, on a, on a, on a smaller level, um, we need to think about resources that we develop that we can use as patches if we need to. Um, studies on how particular news sources um, frame or manipulate certain events um, that we can actually use as teaching tools, right? And I think, uh, especially North is a it's a good place to start the conversation because that's what we're doing for other bits already. Um, so uh, that's something. We, we need to reach out, I think, also to historians uh, because they work with sources a lot, right? Uh, we need to cross that divide. Journalists, exactly, uh, do the same thing, but we don't talk to them. Um, again, that's something positive, uh, like I had mentioned. Um, you, you are still under the same roof, so that should be a conversation that we, we should be able to have. Um, and maybe a last comment on the Ivory Tower, because this is not the first time I hear it. But I, I always wonder how the people who, who uh, accuse academics of the Ivory Tower, how, how many 18-year-olds uh, they get to see on a, on a daily basis. I bet it's not more than me. Um, and, and a lot of you are sitting around the table. So actually, our Ivory Tower isn't, I mean, first of all, it's not made of ivory, right? But it's also not a tower. I think we have a very good sense of what young people think and how they work. Uh, not, of course, we don't see their whole life, but we see an important part of their life. Um, and we do engage with them on, on, on that level. So I think we, we, we're not in the ivory tower, and I don't think we've ever been. Um, but on the other things I, I, I really uh, like to support, yes, I think we should have a bigger role in media literacy. We should work more with news media, like I said, journalists, but also with, with historians. Um, and I'm just less, you know, academics will always be more cautious to take a, to take a side, and that's what you've been in a sense also complaining about, right? Taking a side is something else. Saying something should be legislated about. Well, that's a, right? It's often an opinion. It's not research-based. So academics will always be hesitant to voice their own opinion, even though I think you can make them if you if you really want to. So let's let's see if we can do that. And with that, I, I think I want to close my, my comments for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jos. And uh, Kolya, what are your reflections? Thank you very much. Um, just open the microphone. Thank you. Um, I will start. I will start by by quoting. Um, uh, actually, I'm, I'm quoting uh, Stephen Colbert from 2006, and he himself has been quoted. You see, I'm starting to reference. Um, and he himself has been quoted by the Bundespräsident uh, Frank Walter Steinmeier in Germany in a speech he gave in 2008. Uh, fact or fake? An important distinction for democracy. Um, so he quotes Stephen Colbert. It used to be everyone was entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. But that's not the case anymore. Facts matter not at all. Perception is everything. And in this, um, in this lecture that uh, the Bundespräsident uh, Frank Walter Steinmeier gave, he then elaborates on uh, what you try to avoid uh, to call uh, uh, fake news and uh, goes on by saying uh, that there is a new departure um, and that this departure is the fact that politicians are undermining the validity and cohesion of facts by passing off patent lies as alternative facts and interpreting news reported by serious media outlets as fake news. He goes on in the speech uh, by showing uh, various occasions and examples where, for example, the press is being called lying press, Lügenpresse, or state-controlled media, Staatsfunk. Um, and he goes on, however, uh, to make a very strong normative, um, normative statement why facts matter. And I will quote again. For it is quite clear that a reasonable public discourse can only be successful when it is underpinned by solid, verifiable, and generally accepted facts. A discourse that leads to informed decisions, which enables those exercising political responsibility to be held to account, and which preserves or possibly strengthens trust in democratic institutions. So, a very strong normative argument why facts matter and why actually this idea that simply for the reason of perception you should um, be able and allowed to overcome facts and just to say whatever you want. And in a way, I think we have the same in the academic discourse. And, and what we need to train our students is to uh, make sense 
of the two of the developments which are going on in the public discourse, but also to reflect how, in fact, exactly the same mechanism matters in the academic discourse, and that there, master thesis, bachelor thesis, and later on PhD is actually only adequate, proper academic writing if they actually fulfill these rules, which we adhere to because we have certain normative standards. If we leave these normative standards aside, we will come to a situation where basically fake news is um, welcomed and where actually anything can be referenced as um, it has been said by news. Now, th there is a problem, however, uh, and I, I would like to say um, just two or three more very brief things. First, in the public discourse, I think we have to establish first what is a fact and what is not a fact, right? And that is sometimes not that easy. Um, secondly, um, how do actors relate to fake news? Uh, and I think especially in European foreign policy, uh, this is quite interesting uh, to see um, and also to use this as a, as a study object, right? Um, how does the European Union tackle this in European foreign policy? And for the academic discourse, again, what is a fact and what is not a fact? How we train our students in that direction? And how can we handle fake news in academic discourse? Um, uh, again, uh, one of the questions is, well, perhaps fake news is good news because we have a new rich material of sources, right? Which we can interpret to actually make meaningful um, conclusions and, and explain how, for example, the populist discourse works. Right? So we should not just abandon fake news uh, from, from our academic debates. We should teach students how to engage with them, but in the right way. And then, uh, what is the consequence? What is the consequence of fake news? So I think, and I'm sorry I can't show this, but I will share it with you later. I think we have three things here. We have fake news as unreliable sources, um, which is basically a question of, you know, is it a fact or is it not a fact? Then we have fake news 2, I would call it fake news 2. Fake news 2 is basically when we engage with fake news in order to basically make sense of populist discourse or anything that is related to fake news. And then we have fake news 3. Fake news 3, I would say, is basically a matter of engaging in sources that reveal the competition. The competition of who has the authority, or what we may call the interpretative authority of what is a fact and what is not. And that is actually quite interesting. So, uh, last comment here. Um, with regards to the most, uh, with regards to unreliable facts, and US has already mentioned it, we face uh, a situation that our students are very much confused about where to find the right sources, right? So we have to train them to actually get on the right path and then to engage with the sources, not just secondary sources, but primary sources, and actually by the engagement make sure that actually there is an awareness um, and that referencing is not just becoming a technical process, but actually um, referencing should also be about um, showing you the meaning um, of why it makes sense to engage in sources directly. Secondly, uh, it is important that we, as I said before, do not abandon fake news completely from our curricula because they can say something very meaningful about how society works these days. And last but not least, how does the EU as a foreign policy actor engage um, with fake news, right? The competition over what is a fact and what is not. And here Stratcom um, is actually quite interesting. Uh, the Action Plan on Strategic Communication 2015 led to the establishment of Stratcom, which is basically uh, a unit um, in the External Action Service that is now uh, trying to target Russia's disinformation campaigns uh, in the European neighborhood. And uh, there is a website, EUS, um, EU versus Disinfo, EU, where you can see how the, the information is basically being tackled. But that in itself, the competition of who has the authority to interpret what is right and what is not, tells you something about what the EU is, tells you something about 
which situation we are in, and in terms of capacities, but I'm, I'm sure uh, that we will hear a little bit more about that by Comrade later on as well. It also tells us a little bit about um, the almost impossible fight or battle that the EU is leading here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kolya, as a true academic delivering to us a typology of fake news. <laughs> um, and now uh, we are moving on to Heidi. Thank you very much. I will try to keep it rather short because I think uh, it would feel nice to hear what others have to share. But perhaps just to synthesize some of the things that we already said, I think there are three things that I find important in this discussion. The first one is really this idea of how the data environment changed and what, what technology did to it. The second thing is that we see the switch from teaching to learning, which I think also came out in this idea that it's not so much anymore about teaching our students what to think, but learning them how to think. By themselves. And the third thing I think that I want to come back to it here is this idea that politics is everywhere. And maybe we as academics have to take it much more seriously in showing our students that they have to consider this and actually um, interpret the politics behind the things much more. That's just a few a few comments to all of these three points. So the first thing, the data environment. Um, I still remember Wolfgang Wessels was once telling me that one of his tasks as an academic was to go through all the newspapers and collect what was said on the European Commission or the European Council. So he had these big folders in the end, but he would go through and look. That was, of course, a long time ago. And I think one thing that we all recognize, data nowadays is not in short supply. So there's much more out there. And actually the difficulty, I think, for us, but also for students, is to make sense of all the different data that you can get access to. So I also think when, when talking to students very often, what I feel is not that they have too little data, but that they are bombarded by all this different kind of information. Um, and that, of course, changes the way they work. Um, I also realize when talking to students, I sometimes do the same. Instead of giving them the time and the space to deal with one source and to critically reflect on one source, I want them to read three journal articles, two books, and you know everything else they can find within a week, and I think that also adds to this, this bombardment the students sometimes feel. Um, and of course, their technology changed a lot, but I think we also have to question to what extent is it really fundamentally different of what is there. But I think we have to take it more seriously and also consider how. And it's I think going back to what you to say, consider of how we can discuss together with our students of how we deal with it, but also how we want them to deal with it as academics. And I think related to this is also another trend, and that's something I realized um, in Maastricht, but then also at the in Oxford, is there is this idea that, well, as a good academic, you have to stand out, you have to be loud, you know, you have the more extreme your opinion, the more likely is that someone will pick it up. So there's something to do with this macho behavior that students get the impression it will work because this way they are good, good, critical academics. And I think it goes again, also to something that Jost was saying, it goes against this idea that, well, actually it's about being critical, about considering different accounts, and also trying sometimes arguments that might not be so popular, but actually might be worthwhile to consider. So I really think there are some things there that we have to think about. Closely related this is, that this is to my second point, that I think we have to think much more of how we switch to learning for our students instead of teaching them. Um, and again, I think they can just confirm what Jost was saying. Of course, I think we have agency in there, but I think as academics, we also have to realize that we are just one little piece in a bigger puzzle. And now, especially as academics, I think we also have to take it seriously to change the structural conditions that they are. On my way to the airport, I was listening to BBC4, and they had a big discussion of how higher education is changing in the UK, and then there was a minister, and they asked him, so who is responsible for making sure that students are prepared for the next century? And in opinion, the minister, what did he say? Well, of course, academics should make sure that students are prepared. And it's right, I think we all recognize that. But at the same time, you know, we need the tools, we need the structures to do so. I think we have to, to push that much, much more. Um, Related to these two points, I think, and that comes back to, I think, the differentiation that you had between fake news 
and disinformation. I think one thing that's important that we help our students to understand that information is interpretation. Fake news or fake facts in the end, you know? It's either there or it's not, you know? We can debate how do you how do you just how do you triangulate, how do you make sure you use the data that you trust. But I think what's even more is that they understand that information is interpretation. And information gives you certain data in order to answer certain questions or push a certain perspective. And in the increasing echo chambers that we have on social media, on Facebook, this kind of disinformation is of course becoming much stronger because we then listen to what fits that question, what answer that we want to hear. But it actually excludes everything that would go against against or perspective or opinion. So I think that this is really important that we also show them this differentiation that when we talk about this information, especially in the social media discourse, this is interpretation. It's not data. I think that's something really key. But we also can, I think, again, relate it to the skills that all our students to have. On the last point that I wanted to make, um, and that relates to what Conrad was saying, you know, <coughs> should we as academics take a stance or strong stance? Um, and I, again, I'm not in the UK, but of course, you can't survive without talking about Brexit. And of course, there is <coughs> this strong discussion, what is the role of academia? And what role should academics play in this discussion? Uh, should we take a stance and go outside, even if that means you might be attacked and you might actually be discredited as not being checked with um, And what I find so interesting there is, I think, it's not so much telling the public or the students what I think, but helping them understand, again, to see the politics behind it. To really understand that there is nothing apolitical in this school. But there is always something that is political. And I think understanding this uh, is key also in terms of, of making sure um, that we actually create this environment where we can fight this innovation. Thank you. Okay, thank you Heidi, and uh, I was warned by our friendly host, Adam, that we should finish on time, or to quote me, it would be much better if we finished on time, <laughs> so <laughs> let's do it. Uh, but we still have 15 minutes, almost, so uh, please, any, you know, any comments or questions, and we should also have time to uh, give the floor, especially back to Connor, because there were some questions, but first, guys, uh, I give the floor to you. Anybody who wants to share any comments to what was said, Gergana. Okay. Thank you very much for your very interesting reflections. Um, now I want to come back to the question of, you know, what's the role? Can you hear me? You can turn it on now. Is it too late? Yeah. Is it too late? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I'd like to come back to the question of the role of academia in fighting fake news, or better, what a role of education in, in, in fighting uh, fake news. And I have uh, an example here to share with you. This year in my, in my European neighborhood policy class, I had a student who was reading Russia today on a daily basis for information. So Russia today was the mainstream, right? And, uh, you know, having learned that, it helped me understand why he had the views he had on the neighborhood. And then I was confronted with, you know, a very practical question, what to do, right? Is it right for me to um, sort of let this go? Because after all, you know, we are not there to uh, tell students what to think. And then what I found very helpful was that I consistently started turning the discussion back to theory. Now, tell me if this is your opinion, how is it translated into conceptual language? Can you formulate alternatives to this view? So I consistently try to push him to develop alternatives through the help of theory, basically. I'm not sure I managed to succeed to change his views, but I think little by little I started seeing in him, you know, a self-reflecting attitude, um, uh, which was very encouraging for me to see. Now, having said that, I also face very often uh, sort of criticisms or suggestions from students after the course is over, 
you know, they often say, well, this is very Eurocentric, right? There is, there is a bias here in what we are taught about Russia. And then I find myself also in a very difficult situation, you know, because where are the credible Russian sources, right? Who are sort of the Russian or the sort of the, uh, the voices from uh, the Russian academia that, you know, I'd like to basically have in the curriculum and here, you know, I'm at a loss because I can't point to sources, yet students want to learn what Russia thinks, right? So there is, um, you know, this uh, laguna here, which uh, I actually haven't found a way of, of addressing, but I'm happy to, to take uh, suggestions from you because everything I found from Russian scholars is very empirical. It doesn't relate well to sort of the conceptual discourse that we have on these things in, in, Western, in Western Europe. And I am open actually to, you know, make space in the curriculum for a truly authentic Russian piece that is actually going to, uh, you know, show students, you know, what Russians really think on, on many of these uh, things um, that happen in the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Gergana, and I think it also links to what Just was saying about uh, what students think it means to be critical, right? Because I think many of us think that, yes, it is a good thing to decentralize or decolonize, decolonize curriculum and so on, but sometimes I see very strange reactions from students, and one was on the occasion of Korea, the lecture I had for you the last year, where I know you told me, I don't know if it was a Russian student, but it was a very critical, very smart student, and I was talking about the rule of law and the concepts of democracy and illiberal democracy, criticizing it. You know, talking about Hungary and Poland, and the student kind of being critical uh, said something along the lines, well, maybe this is too Western-centered, and maybe we should listen to the voices of, you know, of these governments, of Eastern Europeans, and allow them space. Mm -hmm. You know, so that was considered oh, as decentering in a sense, right? So there is another kind of confusion uh, here and what it means to be uh, critical. But anyway, I saw the hand of Niels and Nicola. <coughs> yes, I think this is an excellent example of what we exactly should do as academics because I totally agree that we are not there to change the views of our students in the sense of political indoctrination, whatever. Mm -hmm. But we are there to um, give them critical, uh, give them skills on critical reading, critical thinking, and so forth and so on. And it's often also in the learning uh, outcomes of our own uh, bachelor and master programs. And I think part of the problem um, that we are facing is that, might be, that we might not be doing enough to teach them these critical uh, reading um, and, and thinking skills. It's in our programs. But uh, we do um, um, give a lot of attention uh, to substance, to politics, EU politics, and so forth and so on. We also teach them about methodology and philosophy of science and so forth and so on. But really the critical thinking, critical writing skills, I think in many programs, that gets too little attention. Um, talking from my own experience in Leiden, uh, that's what I discovered a few years ago. So we reformed uh, our curriculum and introduced uh, skills working groups. Uh, using substantial uh, material, articles about politics, um, uh, EU, but also other political topics, but then um, using these materials to, to, to learn them uh, how to read a text critically, not only newspaper articles, but also academic articles, um, how to um, um, distinguish um, um, good arguments from bad arguments, and so forth and so on. And these are basic skills that you need to deal with uh, fake news. So I think uh, in that respect, I totally recognize what uh, I think uh, almost all panel members said, that it is a, a wider problem and that you should not make, um, should not uh, have uh, uh, solutions by individual uh, teachers, but it should be addressed um, in the entire uh, curriculum, uh, because it's part of what we have to do as academics, and by getting, giving more attention to these um, uh, critical reading, critical thinking skills, we might um, get very far in addressing this problem of, uh, of fake news. Thanks. Um, I, I'd like to echo, uh, I guess, Heidi's and Koya's mostly um, concerns about not disregarding fake news, but using them for teaching. Uh, but with a little change, um, I, I don't think we should, and this is the change to Koya's statement, we shouldn't uh, allow or normalize uh, the interpretation of facts 
that we should not confuse the students that facts are not open to interpretation, but that facts don't necessarily exist in what they're going to Google. And that's what, what Heidi said, that there is no apolitical truth out there um, that they can take and put in their paper and cite. And besides, yes, there is a problem of how maybe we teach them critique, uh, but I think besides telling them to be critical, we should really just tell them to be thorough. Um, a lot of the misuse of sources is down to um, sloppiness, laziness, uh, cutting corners. Um, so they may learn, we, we may, you know, foam out of our mouths telling them how to interpret sources, but if they're not going to be thorough and they don't feel compelled to look at not two or three, but four or five sources, then... Um, but I also um, wanted to re re respond to Joost, who would say Fox News is not a good source. I, I found myself uh, reading a comment by a, a former colleague of mine who is now saying that the BBC is biased. And I always thought that that cannot be. But I would like to uh, hear what you think. I will give the floor now uh, back to Conrad, as there were already questions also from the panel. Well, um, I w I'll do reverse the argument uh, in a maybe not really serious way. I believe BBC is not biased enough. Yeah. And I will give you an example. I mean, in the pre referendum debate, they were giving airtime to those who defended the UK staying in the EU and those who pushed for the Brexit. And by doing the latter, they were allowing people to say utter lies publicly without questioning those lies, without being able to question those lies. And I really, really, uh, and I know BBC is not going to budge on this and they, they stick to their neutrality abroad, but I really, I, I would love seeing BBC saying I'm not going to allow you to repeat your lies once again uh, on the airtime. Uh, that, that's as simple as that. So, um, well, you, you might disagree with this, this position. Uh, getting back to the ivory the tower thing, um, please, please do not uh, get me wrong. I'm, I'm not saying that you are not the academics. I'm not doing much. No, I wanted to stress how much it's possible that you try to reach the general public. Listen, the problem is not with your students. It's not your students that push the, the United Kingdom into the Brexit, for example. It's the general public, without having the occasion to have the lectures with you, uh, who voted based on lies propagated by the, the Brexiters. As simple as that. And you can ask me, of course, how? I know this is difficult, but then again, look at what those, uh, how to call them, the other side of the barricade. Look what they do. They blog, they publish on Facebook, they tweet, they go to television every occasion they have, etc., etc. They try to be loud, they, they speak up. And I wish the academia speak up as loudly as they do. Yeah. Can I, uh, just a quick response to two things, because I think, I mean, I don't, I mean, I just picked up the ivory tower because, of course, that's uh, this wonderful mm -hmm. expression, right? I, I didn't feel particularly insulted by that, or, or but it's, it's a nice illustration of an image that, that people use. Um, I completely agree with you, but I think that's, in a sense, that's a problem because we academics can't be like that, right? We can't be as loud. We can't be framing things like that because that's not what we are, right, and what we want to do. We need to find our way to, to be heard by being more analytical, uh, yeah, using theories and trying to explain that, and by being, again, providing the evidence. Right? I think that's very important, but I don't think we can beat them at that game because we'll lose. Um, it'll make us more political. But we need to find a, I, I completely agree with you, we need to find a way to engage more. Um, that's absolutely right. And then, Nicola, that actually, it's great that you said that, because I had this in my, in my notes and I didn't say it, because we need to start talking with them. Where, where does this reliability of the sources that we take for granted come from, other than past reliability? What do we say to students about that? 
because it's gonna it's gonna go because they are not using the same sources and so on. So so thanks for actually putting this out there again because that's what we need to talk about. Why why not this particular source, but why another? Thank you. Claudia. Very, very briefly uh, comment on what yours just said. I think we indeed have to be more analytical, but, but there is a species dying out there which we used to be called public intellectual. And a good, good uh, part of the public intellectuals were always coming from academia. And, uh, and I think the, the focus on publishing uh, the next round of articles uh, peer-reviewed articles, the stress, the competition that is out there prevents us from functioning the way academics used to be. Okay, good note uh, to finish this reflective note. So I finish according to the wishes of others and uh, we'll see you at the round table on Poland and the EU. Thank you.